Chapter 6, The Flying Coffin As Japanese planes dove over Oahu some 2,000 miles west, Marines were sitting in a tent on Wake Atoll eating pancakes. The tiny atoll, a strategically critical air base, was home to about 500 bored American servicemen, mostly Marines. Nothing interesting ever happened there. But that morning, as the Marines started on their pancakes, a siren began wailing. Soon the sky was streaked with Japanese bombers, buildings were exploding, and a few startled men found themselves on the front in the Second World War. All over the Pacific that morning, the story was the same. In less than two hours over Pearl Harbor, Japan mauled America's Navy and killed more than 2,400 people. Almost simultaneously, it attacked Thailand, Shanghai, Malaya, the Philippines, Guam, Midway, and Wake. In one day of breathtaking violence, Japan's main onslaught had begun. In America, invasion was expected at any moment. Less than an hour after Japan bombed Hawaii, mines were laid in San Francisco Bay. In Washington, D.C., the civil defense minister locked around in a police car, sirens blaring, shouting calm into a loudspeaker. At the White House, a butler heard the president speculating on what he'd do if Japanese forces advanced as far as Chicago. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt wrote to her daughter, urging her to flee the West Coast. In subsequent days, trenches were dug along the California beaches, windows across America were draped in blackout curtains, and bridges, tunnels, and factories were put under guard. In Nebraska, citizens were taught to disable firebombs with garden hoses. Japan galloped over the globe, invading the Philippines, Guam, Burma, Borno, Rabul, Hong Kong, Singapore. But Wake wouldn't give in. The Japanese bombed and strafed it for days, then launched a massive invasion attempt. The little group of defenders shoved them back. It wasn't until December 23rd that Japan finally captured Wake and the men on it. For days, the captives were held on the airfield, singing Christmas carols to chill, cheer themselves, as the Japanese made plans to, ex plans to execute them. Then plans were changed. Most captives were forced onto ships, bound for Japan, and occupied China as prisoners of war, POWs. 98 men were kept in wake. The Japanese enslaved them. In August 1942, Louis graduated from flight school as an officer, a second lieutenant. He drove to Torrance to say goodbye to his family before heading into his final round of training, then to war. Before he left, his family gathered on their front steps for a last photograph. Louis put his arms around his mother, who was fighting back tears. His father rode with him to the train station, crowded with uniformed young men and carrying, crying parents. Embracing his father, Louis could feel him shaking. As his train pulled away, Louis looked back. His father stood with his hand up, a wavering smile on his face. Louis wondered if he'd ever see him again. The train carried him to Ephrata, Washington, where an air base sat in a dry lake bed. The lake bed was determined to bury the base in blowing dirt, and it was succeeded, succeeding. Men waded through drifts more than a foot deep. All of the mules were gritty with sand and ground crews, which had to replace 24 dirt-clogged aircraft engines in 21 days, had to spray oil on the taxiways to keep the dust down. Louis was standing in the dust, sweating, when a man walked up and introduced himself. He was Russell Allen Phillips. He would be Louis's pilot. The son of an Indiana pastor, Phillips was small, built like a fire plug. A gentle, generous-hearted young man, he was so quiet he could be in a room for hours before anyone noticed him. He had one consuming passion. Back home, where everyone called him Allen, he'd met a girl from the church choir, Cece Perry. She had a curvy figure, a buoyant disposition, a quick mind, and a family cat named Chopper. At a prom in Terry Haute, Allen kissed Cece. He was a goner, and so was she. On a Saturday night in November 1941, where he left for the Air Corps Philippine, Phillips sent five last minutes with Cece at the Indianapolis train station. When the fighting was over, he promised he'd make her his bride. In Euphrata, Louis and Phillips 
became best friends. Phillips floated along in Louis's chatty good humor. Louis liked Phillips's quite kind steadiness. He called Louis Zamp. Louis called him Phil. They never had an argument and were almost never apart. The rest of Phil's bomber crew assembled. The top turret gunner and engineer was Stanley Pillsbury. The other engineer was Clarence Douglas, who manned one of the two waste guns behind the wings. The navigator and nose gunner was Robert Mitchell. Frank Glassman was the belly gunner. Ray Lambert was the tail gunner. The radio man and second waist gunner was Harry Brooks. The co-pilot was George Mosnet Jr. Together, they'd be crew number eight in the nine crew 372nd Bomb Squadron. All the men were bachelors, but Harry Brooks, like Phil, had a steady girl back home. Her name was Jeanette, and she and Harry had set their wedding date for May 8th, 1943. All the crew needed was a plane. Everyone was hoping to be assigned to the B-17, a handsome, fiercely armed, practically indestructible bomber. The plane number one wanted was a giant new... The plane no one wanted was a giant new plane, Consolidated Aircraft Corporation's B-24 Liberator. On paper, the B-24 was comparable to the B-17, but for one major edge. It could fly literally all day without refueling. To the men, though, it left much to be desired. Flat-faced and rectangular, it had the looks only a nearsighted mother could love. Crews called it the flying brick and the constipated lumberer, a play on consolidated liberator. The cockpit was oppressively cramped. Navigating the narrow catwalk could be difficult. One slip and you'd tumble into the bomb bay, which had fragile aluminum doors that would tear away with the weight of a falling man. The B-24's wheels had no steering, so in taxiing, a pilot had to coax the bomber along by powering one side's engines than another and working the left and right brakes, one of which was usually more sensitive than the other. The taxiways were a pageant of lurching planes, all of which eventually veered into places nowhere near where the pilots intended them to go, and from which they often had to be dug with shovels. Flying the B-24, one of the world's heaviest planes, was like wrestling a bear, because pilots strong-armed the yoke, the control lever, with their left hands, they were instantly recognizable when shirtless, because the muscles on their left arms dwarfed those on their right. The plane was so clumsy that it was hard to fly in tight formations without hitting other planes. It was also plagued with mechanical difficulties. If one of the four engines died, staying airborne was challenging. If two quit, it was an emergency. Early on, there were incidents in which B-24's tails fell off in midair, and the plane had a reputation for frailty, especially in the wings, which could snap off if struck in combat. Some men thought it was a death trap. When the 372nd Squadron's planes flew in, Phil's crew walked out to look. Louie heard someone mutter, It's the flying coffin. For the next three months, the crew practically lived in their B-24s. They flew in formation, fired at targets, and simulated combat runs. They buzzed so low over Iowa that the propellers kicked up a sandstorm, skinning the paint off the paint plane's belly and scouring the legs of Pillsbury, sitting by the open tail hatch. The, through it all, Louis perched in the glass-windowed greenhouse in the nose, bombing with superb proficiency. The squadron's prowess was soon well known. An angry farmer came calling after 370 seconds bombs flattened an outhouse. Training transformed Louis's crew. They worked together with seamless efficiency, and in the grim business of bombs and bullets, they were the squadron's best crew. The warmest praise would go to Phil. B-24s were built for tall pilots, and though small-statured, Phil needed to sit on a cushion to get his feet to the pedals and his eyes over the control panel. He was, in Louis's words, a damn swell pilot, dealing with adversity with calm, adaptive acceptance. The surprise of this plane pilot, Louis would learn, was that in a crisis, Phillips was as brave as they come. The crew's B-24 had its own personality. It oozed fuel into the bomb bay, inspiring Pillsbury's nervous habit of pacing around, sniffing the air. It loved 
venting defin deafening backfires. When nearing empty, the fuel gauges sometimes reported that the plane was magically gaining fuel, but for all its quirks, the plane never failed the men. It was a noble thing, rugged and exhaustible. They loved and they loved it. They named it Superman. In October 1942, the men packed their bags. Training was over. They were being sent to Oahu to war. Phil was crestfallen. Cece was about to come see him, and they'd spoken of getting married. He'd miss her by three days. Before he left, Louis sent a package to his mother. In it were airmen's wings. Every morning, as she waited for her boy to return, Louise pinned the wings to her dress. Every night, she pinned them to her nightgown. On November 2nd, Superman lifted off. Land slid away, and there was nothing but the Pacific. Its bottom was already littered with downed warplanes at the ghosts of lost airmen. Every day of this long and ferocious war, more men, more would join them.